amazing. Okay, I hope you like it. Well, here I go. Oops, sorry. Let's see. I thought the people I lived with were my parents. I called them mama and dad. The woman said to me one day, don't call me mama. You're old enough to know better. I'm not related to you in any way. You just bored here. Your mama's coming to see you tomorrow. You can call her mama if you want to. I said thank you. I didn't ask her about the man I called dad. He was a letter carrier. I used to sit on the edge of the bathtub in the morning and watch him shave and ask him questions. Which way was the east or sorry, which way was east or south or how many people there were in the world? He was the only one who had ever answered any questions I asked. The people I, I had thought were my parents had children of their own. They weren't mean. They were just poor. They didn't have much to give anybody, even their own children. And there was nothing left over for me. I was seven, but I did my share of the work. I washed floors and dishes and ran errands. My mother called for me the next day. She was a pretty woman who never smiled. I'd seen her often before, but I hadn't known quite but but I hadn't known quite who she was. When I said hello mama this time, she stared at me. She had never kissed me or held me in her arms or hardly spoken to me. I didn't know anything about her then, I think. Then, but a few years later, I learned a number of things. When I think of her now, my heart hurts. When I think of her now, my heart hurts me twice as much as it used to when I was a little girl. It hurts me for both of us. My mother was married at 15. She had two children before me and worked in a movie studio as a film cutter. One day she came home earlier than usual and found her young husband making love to another woman. There was a big row and her husband banged out of the flat. While my mother was crying over the collapse of her marriage, he sneaked back one day and kidnapped her two babies. My mother spent all her savings trying to get her children back. She hunted them for a long time. Finally, she traced them to Kentucky and hitchhiked to where they were. She was broke and with hardly any strength left when she saw her children again. They were living in a fine house. Their father was married again and well off. She met with him but didn't ask him for anything not even to kiss the children she had been hunting for she had been hunting for so long she she had been hunting for so long but like the mother in the movie stella dallas she went away and left them to enjoy a happier life than she could give them i think it was something besides being poor that made my mother live like that when she saw her two children laughing and playing in a fine house among happy people, she must have remembered how different it had been for her as a child. Her father had been taken away to die in a mental hospital in Patton, and her grandmother had also been taken off to the mental hospital in Norwalk to die there screaming and crazy, and her brother ha had killed himself and there were other family ghosts. So my mother came back to Hollywood without her two children and went to work as a film cutter again. I wasn't born yet. The day my mother called for me at the letter carrier's house and took me to her rooms for a visit was the first happy day in my life that I remember. I had visited my mother before. 
Being sick and unable to take care of me and keep a job too, she paid the letter carrier five dollars a week to give me a home. Every once in a while, she brought me to her rooms for a visit. I used to be frightened when I visited her, when I visited her, and spent most of my time in the closet of her bedroom, hiding among her clothes. She seldom spoke to me, except to say, "Don't make so much noise, Norma." She would say this even when I was lying. Even when I was lying. Sorry. Even when I was lying in bed at night and turning the pages of a book, even the sound of page turning made her nervous. There was one object in my mother's rooms that always fascinated me. It was a photograph on the wall. There were no other pictures on the walls, just this one framed photograph. Whenever I visited my mother, I would stand looking at this photograph and hold my breath. For fear she would order me to stop looking, I had found out that people always ordered me to stop doing anything I liked to do. This time, my mother caught me staring at the photograph, but didn't scold me. Instead, she lifted me up in the chair so I could see better. "That's your father," she said. I felt so excited I almost fell off the chair. It felt so good to have a father. To be able to look at this picture and know I belong to him, to him, and what a one, and what a wonderful photograph it was. He wore a slouch hat, a little gaily on the side. There was a lively smile in his eyes, and he had a thin mustache like Clark Gable. I felt very warm toward this picture, toward the picture. My mother said. He was killed in an auto accident in New York City. I believed everything people told me in that time, but I didn't believe this. I didn't believe he was run over and dead. I asked my mother what his name was. She wouldn't answer. She wouldn't answer, but went into the room and locked herself in. Years later, I found out what his name was, and many other things about him. How he used to live in the same apartment building where my mother lived, how they fell in love, and how he walked off and left her while I was getting born, without even seeing me. The strange thing was that everything I heard about him made me feel warmer toward him. The night I met his picture, I dreamed of it when I fell asleep, and I dreamed of it a thousand times afterward. That was my first happy time, finding my father's picture, and every time I remembered how he smiled and how his hat was tipped, I felt warm and not alone. When I started a sort of scrapbook a year later, the first picture I put in it was a photograph of Clark Gable because he looked like my father, especially the way he wore his hat and mustache. And I used to make up daydreams, not about Mr. Gable, but about my father. When I'd be walking home from school in the rain and feeling bad, I'd pretend father was waiting for me, and that he would scold me for not having worn my rubbers. I didn't own any rubbers, nor was the place I walked to any kind of a home. It was a place where I worked as a sort of child servant. Washing dishes, clothes, floors, running errands, and keeping quiet. Muy bien. But in a daydream, you jump over facts as easily as a cat jumps over a fence. My father would be waiting for me. I I daydreamed, and I would come into the house smiling from ear to ear. Once, when I lay in a hospital, after having my tonsils out and running into complications, I had a daydream that lasted a whole week without stopping. I kept bringing my father into the hospital ward, 
and walking him to my bed, while the other patients looked on with disbelief and envy at so distinguished a visitor, and I kept bending him over, and I kept bending him over my bed and having him kiss my forehead, forehead and I gave him dialogue too. You'll be well in a few days, Norma Jean. I'm very proud of the way you're behaving, not crying all the time like other girls. And I would ask him, please, to take off his hat. But I could never get him in my largest, deepest daydream to take his hat off and sit down. When I went back to my home, I almost got sick again. A man next door chased a dog I had loved and who had been waiting for me to come home. The dog barked because he was happy to see me, and the man started chasing him. and ordering him to shut up. The man had a hoe in his hand. He swung the hoe. It hit my dog's back and cut him in half. My mother found another couple to keep me. They were English people and needed the five dollars a week that went with me. Also, I was large for my age and could do a lot of work. One day, my mother came to call. I was in the kitchen washing dishes. She stood looking at me without talking. When I turned around, I saw there were tears in her eyes, and I was surprised. I'm going to build a house for you and me to live in, she said. It's going to be painted white and have a backyard. And she went away. It was true. My mother managed it somehow, out of savings and a loan. She built a house. The English couple and I were both taken to see it. It was small and empty but beautiful, and it was painted white. The four of us moved in. I had a room to myself. The English couple didn't have to pay rent, just take care of me as they had done before. I worked hard but it didn't matter. It was my first home. My mother bought furniture, a table with a white top and brown legs, chairs, beds, and curtains. I heard her say, it's all on time, but don't worry. I'm working double shift at the studio, and I'll soon be able to pay it off. One day, a grand piano arrived at my home. It was out of condition. My mother had bought it secondhand. It was for me. I was going to, to be given piano lessons on it. It was a very important piano, despite being a little banged up. It had belonged to the movie star uh, Frederick March. You'll, you'll play the piano over here by the windows, my mother said. And here, on each side of the fireplace, there will be a love seat and we can sit listening to you. As soon as I pay off a few other things, I'll get the love seats, and we'll all sit in them at night and listen to you play the piano. But the two love seats were not to be. One morning, the English couple and I were having breakfast in the kitchen. It was early. Suddenly, there was a terrible noise on the stairway outside the kitchen. It was the most frightening noise I'd ever heard. Bangs and thuds kept on as if they would never stop. Something's falling down the stairs, I said. The English woman helped me from going to see. Her husband went out and after a, a time came back into the kitchen. I sent for the police and the ambulance, he said. I asked if it was my mother. Yes, he said, but you can't see her. I stayed in the kitchen and heard people come and try to take my mother away. Nobody wanted me to see her. Everyone said, just stay in the kitchen like a good girl. She's all right, nothing serious. But I went out and looked in the hall. My mother was on her feet. She was screaming and laughing. 
They took her away to the Norwalk Mental Hospital. I knew the name of the hospital in a vague way. It was where my mother's father and grand and grandmother had been taken when they started screaming and laughing. All the furniture disappeared. The white table, the chairs, the beds, and the and white curtains melted away. And the grand piano too. The English couple disappeared also, and I was taken from the newly painted house to an orphan asylum and given a blue dress and a white shirtwaist to wear and shoes with heavy soles. And for a long time when I lay in bed at night, I could no longer daydream about anything. I kept hearing the terrible noise on the stairs and my mother screaming and laughing as they led her out of the home she had tried to build for me. Papito, papita. I never forgot the white painted house and its furniture. Years later, when I was beginning to earn some money modeling, I started looking for the Frederick March piano. After about a year, I found it in an old auction room and bought it. I have it in my home now in Hollywood. It's been painted a lovely white, and it has new strings and plays as wonderfully as any piano in the world. Okay, so I hope you liked it. As you probably noticed, it had lots of language items we have been that have been coming up uh, throughout our course. Like remember uh, this ellipsis here, when we don't repeat the verb, you can call her mama if you want to. Remember Phoebe in France? No, I'd like to, but I don't want to, right? Uh, so you need to master this. Well, of course, people need to master Mm, the use of tenses and you could select useful language with tenses here okay because you have past you know this is storytelling this is like telling stories so you have past perfects okay and you have condition conditionals uh, conditional sentences and the conditional tense too uh, and and a lot of practice with past simple, in use and in pronunciation, you should pronounce this, learn to read the story like I did, okay? You have passives, okay? And, and this, I didn't know anything or I knew nothing. Remember, you can review that too. Connectors, right? Though it's quite simple. The, the issue of connectors here, but very natural. It's not uh, difficult English, but it's it's very well uh, written. Okay, it's it's good. So, I mean, it's not Toni Morrison. I mean, writing right, but it's it's good because you can read it easily, and you need to master the grammar at this level, uh, of course. Uh, there is, and there are, and there were, and there was. You know. Well, have a look and the uh, um, children laughing and playing, you know, the non-personal verbs here. Mm, had been hunting, remember, past, perfect, continuous. Had hunted or, or had been hunting. Uh, see, finally, she traced them to Kentucky. Uh, where they were. Ah, indirect speech. Uh, indirect questions where they were because this has no question mark remember um, was married at 15 this is a passive or is this the verb to be with an adjective you know this is a philosophical question for me notice the the spelling in US American English I learned uh, some of you use the the British spelling, and I use the I use both, but 
you know we 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 can use the different varieties depending uh, who we are addressing right and in exams we can do one in british english and another in us american english as uh, standards so Okay, but you have to be consistent. When we write, we have to be consistent. Not when we speak, maybe, but because there's a lot of... She would say this. She would say, this would is not hypothetical. This is used to. So when you find a would, check if it is a modal auxiliary for past habits, like in this case, used to, see? I used to be frightened. When I visited, don't mix up the adjectives in ED and the adjectives frightening with ING, which some of you still do at times, okay? Be careful because that's a very bad mistake for a C11 student, okay? I used to be, usually when you have first I uh, used to, then we usually change to would, okay? for repeated actions, repeated past actions, okay? Um, look, ING subjects, being sick and unable to care of me and keep a job too. Ah, uh, well, no, this is not uh, because it has a comma and there's a subject here with a verb. So this is a, uh, remember, um, participle clause making the structure more interesting. Do you remember? They, they could be ING participle clauses, like gerund participle clauses, or ED, past participle clauses, like set in the United States, the story tell, the story is about a girl who, da 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 da. Remember? Participle clauses, present and past. Hmm? Present is with ing and past is with ed. Um, notice every once in a while, no time phrases come at the beginning or at the very end. Mm. Well, I couldn't underline this wonderful book. Okay, it was kind of expensive, so I am improvising. I felt so excited. I almost fell off. Remember that off with a double F, we do pronounce the F as an F, and, and it's got this sense of <laughs> off, like a little bit like away, but off. I fell off. Uh, the strange thing was, this is a cleft sentence, bringing a focus to, the, the, to what comes here, it's a way of bringing focus, no? The strange thing was, and now we focus our attention on what she says, conditioned by the word strange, no? The strange thing was, the interesting thing was, this is a cleft sentence, okay? Instead of saying, everything I heard about him made me feel warmer, we make emphasis using a cleft sentence like this and we say the strange thing was that everything i heard about him the night i met his picture the night in which or when i met his picture the omission of the relative in this case the relative adverb okay i dreamed of it i fell asleep well there are so many i think that if you if you look at your language checklist, you will see that you will find examples of all the language items that I listed on the language checklist for you to work on uh, when you look for useful language. Look, I daydreamed. Father would, would be waiting for me. Look here, this is uh, hypothetical, right? But in a daydream, you jump over facts as easily, da, da, da. My father would be waiting for me. This is hypothetical. Me estaría esperando, no? I daydreamed, soñaba, and I would come into the house y yo entraba en la casa. Claro, entraría en la casa, pero en español no lo decimos así. Y yo entraba en la casa. We use a past... Mi padre me estaría esperando. Aquí sí usamos el condicional. O me estaba esperando. 
y yo entraría en la casa o entraba en la casa, ¿no? Sonriendo, ¿ves? Aquí uno de sin sujeto, un, una forma no personal. El verbo lay, que sale también lying in bed, aquí. I was lying in bed. Hay muchas cosas. Who, los who y los which, ¿no? I had love and who had been waiting for me to come home. El almost. Even, si veis algún even. Ok, chasing. Bueno, hay tanto. Disbelief, los prefijos para la workshop on, en eso, ¿no? Uy, ya 27 minutos. Bueno. Also, acordaros que si inicia frase es además, no es también. Si inicia frase y va seguido de coma es además, no es también. Vale, bueno. Uh, pay off es liquidar una deuda. Bueno. Uh, el, el estilo indirecto está aquí, que os pondré algo en la magazine. Ok. I was taken, ¿veis? Una pasiva, me llevaron. ¿Veis lo que os dije de la pasiva? En español decimos en impersonales de ellos o ellas. Impersonales donde no importa el sujeto ese. Lo ponemos en plural. Y en inglés prefieren decir I was taken. La protagonista, ¿quién es? La persona que es llevada. Entonces, yo, I was taken. ¿Vale? Eh, no hay que traducir porque si no te haces un lío. Hay que entender las cajitas y vale ok I hope this is useful ok use it uh, this summer or this week ok and don't forget to to contribute to the magazine ok before we the deadline ends ok bye